uh, I'm glad to see that everyone here. Um, we have C-SPAN taping this event. Um, we will um, begin with a, a conversation we have with us. Uh, well, first, let me introduce myself. I'm Leila Halal. I'm uh, directing the Middle East Task Force here. Um, and we have with us today two distinguished guests. And um, we're very excited to, to have this conversa conversation at such a timely uh, period in Egypt's history, as we see from the news that it continues to face um, turmoil and, and upheaval. Um, to my left is Rob Malley. He's currently the Middle East uh, and North Africa Program Director at the International Crisis Group. He really probably needs uh, no introduction for those of you here um, who, are, who are based in, in D.C. Um, but prior to his uh, tenure at the ICG, he was special assistant to President Clinton for Arab-Israeli affairs, and he was the executive assistant to Samuel Berger at the national, uh, as a national security advisor um, from 1996 to 1998. Um, he is published widely. He is a leading analyst on Middle East affairs, and we're very glad to have him with us today. Um, to my right is Ashraf Khalil, not from Washington, um, and a fresh voice for us in, in DC. Um, he is a Cairo-based journalist, and he's been covering the Middle East for 15 years. Uh, he was a correspondent with La Los Angeles Times and covering Baghdad and Jerusalem, um, or based in, in both places. Mm -hmm. Yes, you were in Jerusalem. Um, he has previously reported for the Wall Street Journal, um, Foreign Policy, and the Times of London, and The Economist as well. He is a blogger at the very popular um, The Arabist, which was founded by Asandra Al Amrani. Um, so we are here uh, largely at the, to, to launch Ashraf's uh, new book. It was published just uh, last month. Um, we have copies outside. It's entitled Inside the Egyptian Revolution and the Birth, Rebirth of a Nation, Liberation Square, a very sort of emotive um, cover. Mm. We, uh, you know, this book has been received to quite uh, critical acclaim. Salan no noted that uh, it was perfectly calibrated in its amount of background commentary and prognostication, and above all, a thrilling account. Um, Publishers Week described it as an essential reading, evoking the urgency and vitality of the Arab Springs Egyptian ch chapter. Um, and the Daily Beast noted that it paints a full canvas of the tools of domination built by Mubarak's police state. So um, we have copies of the book that will be arriving, and afterwards Ashraf is available to, to sign um, and, and chat with you further, as uh, I think Rob has to leave immediately, but... Um, um, we will try to cover as much ground as we can in the discussion. Um, just, to, just to begin with you, Ashraf, um, your book s sort of sweeps through three decades of Mubarak's rule um, before going into tracking the 18 days of uh, revolt, the Toppletim, and then you close with some commentary on the key transitional challenges ahead, which are economic c corruption, media freedom, and security reform. Um, and you, you know, what, what I think, you know, with the developments in Egypt in the past 48 hours, there's clearly a very current conversation to have about Egypt. And I think events are changing quite quickly. That, um, but, but I think it's also important to, to, to keep track and to note um, what, what led up to, to this revolution. Um, in your book, you, um, and, and just to note, you, you've been based in Cairo for, uh, since 1997. For 15 years, which means that you didn't just uh, land in Cairo when, when on January 25th, mm -hmm. 2011. So you obviously saw this lead up, and you describe in your book the increasing stranglehold of the regime and then uh, the agitation of, of people on the ground towards, towards it. Um, and, and I remember that as the Tunisian dictator fell, many said that Egypt would not. Um, but in less than three weeks, <laughs> Mubarak was gone. So was this a surprise to you? There was a lot of, immediately after Tunisia, there was a, a lot of chatter 
in Egypt. I mean, the activist forces there were openly trying to figure out how to make the same thing happen and, and, and trying to lay the groundwork uh, for, for a similar uprising. But you heard so much, oh, that can't happen here. That, uh, I, I remember talking to, on the 26th actually, the day after the start of the revolution when, when you had these unprecedented numbers turning out and really taking the country into uncharted waters, I remember just getting in a cab and wanting to go to Tahrir and, and, and having like the, the, the classic cynical cab driver who, who was basically like, oh no, we're, we can't do what the Tunisians did. Tunisia is a civilized country. We are, we, 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 you know, that, that, that he, he, even then, Egyptians did not believe that they could pull this off. And I think one of the stories of the Mubarak regime was, is that it, people kind of lost faith in themselves. He really killed the sense of political engagement and, and really sowed this feeling of helplessness in the people. I mean, as, as dictators go, he wasn't Saddam Hussein, he wasn't Hafez al-Assad, he wasn't Gaddafi. There will be no mass graves being unearthed in, in Egypt. But he really sort of killed their spirit and it took a while, but I mean, people just lost faith in themselves. And so one of the, immediately before the revolution started, the Arab League had a summit uh, in Sharm el-Sheikh, an economic summit. And it was, it was right after Tunisia and right before Egypt. And the Egyptians were starting to set themselves on fire. You had that very disturbing little mini trend happening in Egypt. And all the Arab League delegates were all like, oh no, it's not possible. This is not Tunisia. You know, everybody had a reason why Egypt could not why the example could not be repeated. And the one guy who was off message, I give him credit for this, was Amr Musa. From day one, he was there and he was the head of the Arab League. He's supposed to be in lockstep with these guys. And I was shocked by the quotes I got from him. He was, he was basically saying, no, this is a wake up call. There's, there's things that really need to change. You know, this, this could spread. We have to be very careful. We have to sort of acknowledge that people will not be marginalized anymore. I remember the quote vividly. So right, but but this but this sense of of marginalization and, mm. and this resistance to it certainly did not was not new, it wasn't a sense that people suddenly on January twenty fifth or or, or uh, mm -hmm. what was the date when when Ben Ali fell uh, two weeks almost month. exactly two weeks before so right. about the eleventh maybe so the it wasn't on that date that suddenly people realized that that they have. Um, that they have a grievance towards the regime. And, and I th it wasn't that either that they hadn't tried to express themselves. I mean, there were events leading up to the revolution that, that enabled it eventually to begin. I mean, you could say that Tunisia was, um, was, a, was a catalyst in the sense, mm -hmm. but, but it wasn't the sole reason for the uprising in, it, in Egypt. It certainly wasn't the sole reason. It wasn't the reason that people had grievances. It wasn't the reason that people felt the need to have a revolution, but it did open the door of what was possible. You know, it, it broke, it chipped, it didn't break it. They broke it on the 25th, I think, but it, it really chipped away at the sense of helplessness that had, that had taken hold over the previous decade plus in Egypt. So just seeing that it was possible really changed the game. But obviously, going back, you have so many bad elections, you have so many cases, such so many cases of rampant police brutality and corruption. The case of Khalid Said, uh, the young man who was beaten to death in Alexandria in June 2010, and whose name became just this touchstone for the lawlessness and unchecked brutality and of of, of the Interior Ministry under Mubarak. You know that that was big. You know, and I try to sort of mark out. You know, here was a turning point, and here was a turning point. But I still I, I maintain that without Tunisia. Maybe there would have eventually been some sort of revolution, but it does not happen like this, and it does not happen on this timeline without the Tunisians setting an example. Okay, I'm going to ask you to just read quickly a passage from your book, um, the start of uh, the first chapter, which is entitled The Accidental Dictator. Um, I think this chapter quite um, you know, amusingly and humorously tells sort of the story of that and the attitude uh, from the beginning of the chapter. Sure. Um, of the attitude of the people and, and the, perhaps now um, what's in their minds as they, they face their current struggle in, in the, against the SCAF and in 
Uh, this is uh, chapter one, it's called The Accidental Dictator. Imagine for a moment that President George Bush the first had suddenly died in office, leaving Dan Quayle, a national punchline who nobody thought would ever wield any real power as President of the United States. Then imagine that nearly three decades later, that same perceived lightweight was still running the country, that an entire generation of Americans had never known any other leader, that he and Marilyn Quayle were busily renaming public buildings, bridges, and libraries after themselves, and that President for Life Quayle was seemingly grooming one of his children to continue the family business of running the country. If that seems far-fetched, it's not too far from the reality that Egyptians have been living through for nearly three decades. Put simply, Hosni Mubarak's era as Egypt's modern-day pharaoh was never supposed to happen. One of the core ironies of Mubarak's 29-year death grip on Egypt was that he stumbled into what was probably the most important and influential job in the modern Middle East entirely by accident. It's a reality that became abundantly clear from the very beginning of the 18-day uprising in the winter of 2011 that finally toppled Mubarak. Once protesters succeeded in shattering the police state that had kept him in power, it became immediately clear that there really was no plan B. Mubarak's regime in its final days fell back on a parade of antiquated, insincere rhetoric, uninspired and tone-deaf concessions, and finally one last effort at vicious violence in a desperate attempt to retain control. It all served to underscore that hiding behind the truncheons and tear gas of the Central Security Riot Police was an intellectually bankrupt and cynical blank space of a regime. That's why there was a distinct undercurrent of bitterness and shame mixed in with the euphoria and the, and the resurgent sense of empowerment coursing through the Cairo streets that February when Mubarak, meek, uh, when Mubarak meekly left the stage. The sentiment was something approaching, I can't believe we let these guys run our lives for decades. Thank you. Um, I think that, that that's, you know, that sort of speaks to, to the sentiment of revolution and, and the, and the um, when, when there's mass mobilization, that mobilization sort of carries, um, creates a dynamic that, that creates sort of an unstoppable uh, movement towards a new reality. And, and I think that, you know, we saw that very clearly in Egypt um, and the quick fall of the regime. But we, we also contrast it with a place like Syria, mm -hmm. where you know, after 10 months of uprising um, and, and clear sort of public statements and, uh, from the Arab League and, and uh, the U.S. and other major players for the regime to, to go, there's still, uh, it still holds tightly to power. And, and I wonder, you know, what, what in these revolutions is the tipping point? What, what, what makes the difference in terms of, of changing uh, the dynamic on the ground where to confront such entrenched power? And you were, you were in Tahrir for, for those 18 days. So, you know, in your, your observation, what, at what point did the balance of power change? What was the tipping point? I think, I think there was multiple small tipping points with, with Tunisia as the final shove over the cliff. I mean, I think you had, you know, multiple years of the relationship between the police, the interior ministry and its relationship to the citizens became toxic maybe 10, 15 years back and just stayed that way. And you had so many cases of that. The economic situation is an underreported possibly element of this in that, that you know, seeing not just how much harder life became as costs went up and salaries stayed the same, but seeing the top 5% obviously flourishing so well and obviously seemingly operating under a completely different set of rules than everybody else was operating under. That played a role. Uh, you know, the, the November 2010 parliamentary elections was just such a clear slap in the face that you know, that, that just showed it was it, the, you know the, the ballot stuffing was so over the top that it just showed that the government was regressing as much as anything. And and one of my I mean, this is kind of a corollary to 
the, the economic situation in that because of the economy, because of the lack of jobs, you had successive generations of young men who had no hope of ever getting married. They couldn't find a good job. University degrees, 28 years old, 35 years old. Nothing, you know, the only jobs available were ones that didn't pay them enough to even make it worth getting out of bed, which means they can never move out of their parents' homes, which means they can never get married and never really start their life. I actually think one of the underreported aspects of this is how much pure sexual frustration played into <laughs> the Egyptian revolution in that yes. you had generations that could never start their lives, could never afford to get married. But on the, and you talk about that in the book, you, you, you note this, uh, this film, cultural, cultural film. Film coffee, cultural um, film, yes. As, as, you know, it's a, it's a humorous uh, slapstick comedy about mm -hmm. these guys that are trying to find a place to watch a porno film. And um, because, because they're living at home, they have university degrees, but yet they're living at home, they're, they're in their late 20s. Um, but because they can't get married, they can't they 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 can't find a place to be alone. They can't have sex. They they can't. Um, so they're stuck. But you know what what is humorous is actually poignant because it, it tells the story of the frustration. And I and met guys that, on the protest lines who might as well have been characters from that film. In that right. they're you know they tell me with two sentences. I know their entire life. They're, they they graduated. They have a good degree, but they don't have any influence. Their father couldn't hook them up with a job or didn't have an apartment waiting for them to get married in. So they're just, they're just 28 at home, but and that's have, their life. Ha have these people returned to their homes? Are they still in the street? Because um, you know, we're hearing of continued demonstrations mm -hmm. and, and protests, but we're also being told of the silent majority, which uh, doesn't support the protesters, and the protesters are in the minority. So where, where are these frustrated youth? Are they just, are they just, <laughs> Are they sort of overcome by a sense of uh, pessimism, or do they desire to just return to normality? You know, the, is, has the revolution become sort of a marginalized effort, um, despite the continuing uh, need for for change and reforms? It's it's a good question. I mean, what, some of these youth are still out there protesting, and many of them have gone home. And, and the issue of whether to continue street action is a very divisive issue, as you said, in Egypt. The, uh, the November and December clashes, you know, you had two separate outbreaks of violence that were like in and around the electoral cycle. It was bizarre. You would have massive violence and people dying and people losing eyes. And a week later, five days later, and three blocks away, you'd have a polling place open with a line down the block. And then a week later, there'd be massive violence on that same stretch of street. It was, it was surreal. But I think you're right in that those protests, especially in November and December, were hugely unpopular. You know, I can honestly say they did not represent the majority of Egyptians. But if you ask the protesters, they're totally fine with being in the minority. They think they were in the minority a year ago. You know, they think the phrase that you hear in Arabic all the time is Hizb al kanaba the party of the couch, which is their derisive term for the, the, the silent majority of fence sitters that basically sat at home nervously watching television and came out to join the party on February 11th, uh, you know, after this 10%, 15% hardcore minority did all the hard work for them. I mean, I'm speaking, uh, like, I'm just telling you what they're thinking. So they know they're in the minority at this point, and they're totally fine with that. Right. So, <coughs> so Rob, I'm just going to bring you in now, and, and I think, you know, we've... Um, you, you've, you were in Egypt uh, in December and January, and you had the opportunity to meet with a cross-section of political actors, and you have your own sense of, of what's going on there on the ground. And um, recently, in the past 48 hours, we've seen that um, the demonstrations have sort of been renewed, um, with, and there, there is a block of activists and liberal parties that have um, come out with a platform for, uh, for the military to turn over executive powers to an elected civilian president. Um, and in fact, you know, my sense from reading the news is that there's an effort to sort of to, to build public consensus around this demand for the military to, to um, hand over powers. This, the, but the military is resisting this, um, and, and the understanding is that they want to maintain uh, control 
over the, the drafting of the Constitution in order to build in protections of their major interests. Um, and yesterday, when, when the protesters attempted to advance on the parliament, interestingly, I think, to, to hand their demand for transfer of civilian power to, the, to this new elected um, body, the Muslim Brotherhood um, blocked, uh, mm -hmm. blocked that event. Um, and, and so what I'm wondering is, you know, you know, are we facing the counter-revolution in Egypt? Um, you know, is, is, is there an effort now to just solidify the new reality um, which, which people in the streets um, feel is not consistent with their original demands for um, empowerment, dignity, uh, I don't know, civil liberties, um, given, given the interim period where the SCAF has uh, cracked down violently on, on demonstrators and, and, and uh, asserted itself um, in a way that indicates that it wants to re retain um, its prior control over the economy, over um, sort of foreign affairs. Is this the counter-revolution um, in your uh, opinion? And first, um, two preliminary uh, yeah. comments. Th thank you for your very nice introduction, though when you insist on uh, that Ashraf is outside of Washington, you sort of depict me as a Newt Gingrich to his view. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, I appreciate it. Um, secondly, I highly recommend you all read the book, which is both extremely informative and very entertaining. Um, I want to touch on a few, a few of the points that, that you did. Uh, first, you, you make the comparison between Egypt and Syria and others. I think there's one element which, is, which has been decisive in a number of these, uh, of these cases, which is what's the attitude of the security forces? I mean, in Egypt, you could make the argument that it was both a revolution and a military coup, and it's unclear which of those two was more important when. Uh, military coup may be piggybacking on, on a popular uprising and, and trying to perpetuate Mubarakism without Mubarak. Whether they'll succeed or not is a different matter, but I think that's part of the reason why things went so quickly. In Syria, there's, in my view, no such chance. You can't have the current regime surviving by deposing the power structure. They just, it's much harder to do. They may try, but I think it's much harder to do because they feel like once Bashar goes, they may all go with him, and that's a much more dangerous scenario. So that, that, that's, that's point number one, and I think if you look at Yemen, if you look at Bahrain, all these cases, one of the key determining factors is how is the security apparatus constituted, what is its nature, and what's its relationship with, with the regime. Um, second point, and this is a, you mentioned the Arab counter-revolution. That's the title of the article that Hussein Aga and I wrote several months ago. Um, one of the points we make in the piece is that the Egyptian revolution in particular was sort of an anti-Leninist revolution. You know, yes, I think Ashraf is right that they were people organizing it, but there was no clear leadership. It was entirely nonviolent, at least in terms of the protesters. Uh, there was no ideology behind it. There was not a program. You didn't have the Communist uh, Manifesto. You didn't have... Uh, uh, right. It, were, it wasn't even like the Iranian revolution in that sense, which was an extraordinarily powerful uh, attribute of, attribute of, of, of the uprising because it was almost impossible for the regime to tackle. They were much better prepared to deal with a violent uprising than they were with this I, because it's sort of like jello. They didn't know how to, how to go after it. But the strength of the revolution, I think in many ways, made it, it was a weakness after Mubarak was, was toppled because you didn't really have a party, a constituency, an agenda, you had protesters. And I think that brings me to your, to your main question, which is, what is today the power of these protesters? Um, and, and why is it that you have this tension between those in Tahrir Square and, and, and others, maybe the silent majority? You know, when I, when I was in Egypt, lots of the conversations I had revolved around that. And I think, I agree with Ashraf that a lot of the people on the street don't really care if they're a minority, and they believe that they were a minority then. Something has changed. There's been an election. And a number of the Egyptians I spoke to, even who might have been sympathetic to the revolution at the time, said, wait a minute, we just had an election. I'm going to come up with a number, maybe it's, I'm exaggerating or, or not, maybe I'm underestimating, but I think about 80% of those who are represented in parliament today have the view that the process that was agreed, you have elections, then you're going to have a, con a, a constitution that's going to have to be put to referendum, then you're going to have the presidential elections, and then the military is going to have to cede power. Most of the people, vast majority of those who voted and who, are, and who are represented in parliament, believe that that's okay. And then you have a large number of demonstrators, but who didn't perform particularly well in the elections, who are calling for another trajectory, another, another timetable, 
it's hard today for them to have, in the long term, le the legitimacy they had, even as a minority during the revolution, when you now have a legitimate process, I mean, with faults and, 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 and whatnot, but a legitimate process that put in power people who are prepared to live with the, uh, with the timetable that was agreed. I think that's a, that's a real problem now for the people. That's a big who distinction, are you're right. It's a big, I'm sorry. Big distinction, you're right. Yes, and I don't know how. I think over time their legitimacy is going to erode. It will revive, in my view, if and when the politicians who are elected in power prove incapable of dealing with the big problems that Egypt has to deal with, whether it's the political transition, whether it's the economy, whether it's security. That's when perhaps the protesters can revive their legitimacy. But right now, I think they're gonna, they have to make a calculation, which is how do we maintain legitimacy when most Egyptians who voted seem to have voted for something different? And I think the Muslim Brotherhood has been very clever so far in managing a complex sort of triangle relationship between itself, the SCAF, and the protesters. And their view, I think, is to say to the protesters, we agree with a lot of what you're calling for, but right now there's a political process which we have to defend, which is why they formed this human shield uh, to prevent the protesters from, from, uh, from gaining access to the parliament. Um, I think it's going to be a very interesting game now between those, what I see those three actors, the SCAF, the Muslim Brotherhood, and the protesters, all three of them sort of playing blind chess because actually worse than blind chess. They don't know what the other party is going, how the other parties are going to act because it's a new game. They don't even really know how they're going to act because it's a new game for them as well. So, Ashraf, can you comment a bit and, and tell us sort of how you see the, the relationship between the SCAF and the Muslim Brotherhood unfolding, um, the power of the protesters? Um, because I know I've heard you in other contexts say that, that, they, that the street has been able to extract concessions and, and you see that as, as an important uh, dynamic. But what is the, the sustainability of those protests given that you have the elected parliament, um, given that people just want to see you know, real change on the ground? Um, well, I, I do believe that, I mean, one of the, if, if anything, the, the military has only itself to blame for the, for the for the, the stubbornness, the enduring stubbornness of the protesters, because the protesters can, can pick up a calendar and point to street action concession, street action concession. They, can, they, they cannot be blamed for thinking that the only thing that has produced genuine serious concessions from the military has been street action. You know, even, even the current timeline of, of the military departing in June 2012, that's a result of the hugely unpopular November clashes. Uh, but what we're heading into, Rob is very, very, uh, is, is correct in that the, the election, the flawed but largely successful, and no one can say it was an insincerely run election uh, and well attended, does change the math and does change their legitimacy and does affect a lot, you know, much of the country, as he said, agrees with what the protesters want, most of what the protesters want, but just wants some stability and calm and just, now's not the time. What's the difference between if the military leaves on February 15th or if the military leaves on June 15th? Is that five months really worth holding up the country like this? And that's a very persuasive argument. And now, as far as internal protester dynamics, this alliance between the brotherhood and the military, it's been coming for a long time. They've been flirting for a while and had their quarrels, etc. But now we're seeing it made tangible where the Brotherhood is now protecting the government, the parliament, the, 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 you know, and, and by proxy the military, I suppose, from the other protesters. So it's, it's, it's interesting to see that final piece click into place. And, and, and I'm curious to see where it goes from here. But, but that's, that's, that's it, it's been coming for a while, but that's, that's new territory. I, just, I think that's a very important point that, that Ashraf makes about, and it goes to the, what I was trying to say about how nobody really knows how to play the rules of the game. I think the SCAF has been quite extraordinarily incompetent because it could have made a lot of the concessions before the protest, which would have really undermined and undercut the, the, the relevance of the protest. But as he says, every time they've reacted, which both emboldens the protesters and discredits the military. Up until now, I think the Muslim Brotherhood has been able to be in a win-win situation. I'm not sure how long it will last. On the mm -hmm. one hand, they have this tacit agreement with the military. And they're not the ones who are causing chaos on the street. So they also appeal to those Egyptians who want normalcy. I think that's a large reason why they did so well, because they were both an agent of change and a familiar, a familiar figure 
that was in favor, favor of stability. Um, and they've been able also to take advantage when the protesters extract concessions from the military, they benefit. If, if there's more power turned over to the civilians, if you accelerate the timetable, that's benefited the Muslim Brotherhood. So they've been able to both sort of placate the military and take advantage of the concessions of the protesters without themselves having to clash with the military. As I say, I don't know how long that lasts because at some point, soon, they're gonna hold the reins of power, they're gonna be responsible, people are gonna turn to them when things are not going well in the economy, in the security, or in any other area. But so far, I think they have been quite astute, probably a product of their great strategic patience and having learned to, over the years how to deal with adversarial conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so they've been, I think they've been able to play that game quite well. And one quick, a very quick thing I wanted to add as far as the, the military brotherhood relationship in that you know, the brotherhood is counting on keep holding the military to this, uh, to this timetable of departure on June, uh, in June 2012. I remember being in Suez on election day and interviewing a voter and he, you know, he was wearing a Freedom and Justice Party pin, you know, a Muslim Brotherhood Party pin. And I flat out asked him, do you trust the military? And he gives me this huge smile and he's like, you know what, I don't need to trust them. It's, it's not relevant whether or not I trust the military. And the implication there is if they drag their feet on this June 2012 thing, we'll all just go back to Tahrir. And, and you know, they're not losing sleep over that because they, they know they've got the stick. Right, but I think also uh, you know, what the, the complication becomes that you have this elected parliament. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think you know, the, the people will be looking to the elected parliament. I, I, think, I don't think that the SCAF wants to retain um, the executive powers. I think no. it, it will give, it will turn over. Um, but the question becomes, how much power will they, will they retain? Um, the attempt to, to um, stay, to delay the transfer, of, to the transfer of power to a civilian president and holding of the elections for that, um, the attempt to delay it, I think, is to control the constitution-making process or, or have some control of it um, to, retain, to retain their, their major interests. Um, and I think that the Brotherhood is, is you know, perhaps willing to, to allow the SCAF to, to retain powers in foreign affairs, um, to ultimate powers, um, to, to have uh, the immunity, to have um, control over the budget. Um, and, and so it will allow the SCAF to, to do that. Um, and so, um, but, but the question I, I have is, um, there's clearly, a mounting um, dissent in, in the public against, um, against SCAF's continued uh, control. Um, and, if, and if they continue to maintain that control and the Brotherhood is seen to, to be aligning with them, um, will the parliament lose legitimacy? Um, and, and what kind of democratizing role can it play in, in, the, in the contested atmosphere? And just to point out some of the, the developments um, that occurred, Amr uh, Hamzawi, who is, who is a liberal um, member of parliament, is uh, proposing a resolution to allow the, the holding of elections in, um, in April, and in order that the power be transferred um, by May first to a civilian president so that the constitution-making process isn't completely in, in military uh, uh, hands um, and and the, the there were liberal members of parliament that walked out of the session yesterday um, because of their complaint that the the speaker of the house who is um, from from the freedom and justice party the Muslim Brotherhood party um, was biased in his uh, in his deliberations and who he was allowing to speak so I mean there is a small chance that the parliament will will be and, and if the protesters maintain a sit-in in front of the, the parliament, there is a chance that it will lose its legitimacy. Um, in parliament. This, the parliament, in this contested environment. Um, is, is that analysis, does it make sense in your mind? Um, what, what is the support that the parliament enjoys in, in Egypt now? I, at this point, I think there's a lot of hope for them. I'm not sure if there's a lot of faith, but there's a lot of hope. And, and they are the product of, as, as we said, a, a flawed, but, but not insincerely run and well-attended election. They are the product of 
you know, by default, but the best election Egypt has had in, in how many decades. So that brings them quite a bit of legitimacy. Um, but it's th going to be raucous. It's going to be a mess. These are people who don't forget that no matter how well-intentioned everybody is, these are people who don't have that much experience as Democrats. I mean, the, the, the Brotherhood, for all their decades of struggling, they, they're, you know, they don't have a democratic structure you know, internally necessarily, and they're, they're, they're not going to, people are going to probably uh, have temper tantrums and fall out with each other and mistake the natural processes of a democratic coalition building experiment and take things personally when they probably shouldn't take things personally. It, it's going to be messy for a while. So I'm just uh, two points. First, I, I've always looked at sort of the, 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 not just the fact that Tunisia inspired Egypt, but a lot of the problems that you have in Egypt are a magnified, magnified version of, of what Tunisia has gone through. And right now, I mean, the elections in Tunisia went well, but for those who are following it, there's a lot of fighting in parliament, there's a lot of suspicion of the Islamists, there's demonstrations of secular forces. So all that, I, I think mm -hmm. Al-Sharif is absolutely right. We're gonna see all that, that's inevitable. I think the question also that you ask is about um, how people are gonna react to the military's not its attempt to control, as you said, I don't think they want executive power. I think they'd be very happy not to have to deal with what is going to be an extraordinarily challenging economic uh, Yeah, agenda. they don't want the headache. I Who agree. does? I mean, you know, I don't know why they'd want to control. They would like to have all their, well, they want to maintain some of their prerogatives. Immunity from prosecution, clearly. Uh, no taxation for its, their economic activities. Maintain their economic activities. The secrecy of their budget. And an overall uh, uh, leadership in foreign policy and national security affairs. My sense is if it was simply left up to the Muslim Brotherhood based on what I've heard from them, they could live with that. They could live with it, number one, because they're realistic and a lot of these things, you know, they don't think really uh, undermine their, their, their power. But also, again, as I said, they have a long view of history. Okay, as they put it, two years, three years, five years, a decade, sooner or later, I mean, they, they have in mind several examples around the region. They don't want to be Algeria in the early 90s when the military got so afraid of a possible victory of the, of the Islamic uh, Salvation Front that there was a, mass, a coup and massive repression, number one. They don't want to be like Hamas either, where they're isolated, they can't govern, the international community uh, tries to boycott them, so they want to have a coalition. They look at Turkey. It took the AKP many years. But today the military is in its place, many of them in prison, or at least be, uh, uh, going to be tried. If it takes them years, they can do it. They've been in the underground for so long now. Now, the question you asked, which is, I think, a very pertinent one, is will the people on the street and other forces start complaining and say this isn't good for us? In a way, the Muslim Brotherhood, as I said, could win either way. They could live with this arrangement, this pacted transition, where it takes, you know, you have an agreement between the military and the political forces. They could probably also live with an acceleration of the transition and some of these prerogatives not being handed over so long as they feel like it doesn't provoke a reaction by the military that's going to compromise what they and jeopardize their hard-earned gains. And I think the question, one question is, if they maintain these prerogatives, can there be the kind of changes that will be the economic uh, changes, um, the, the changes in the security forces, um, these important, the, the opening of the media, um, Will you be able to, to have these sorts of institutional changes that will signal to the people that, in fact, it's a new era? Ideally, what we're, we're going to need to see, I mean, we're, we're, we're focusing on sort of the, the macro stuff of the relationship between the government and the military and, and, and the control of the military's budget, but there, there, are, there are smaller revolutions that need to happen that would be significant victories, a genuine anti-corruption campaign, a genuine attempt to weed out dead wood and nepotistic hires from the government, um, a genuine attempt to instill responsible actual journalistic ethics within the media or just shut down, you know, the, the places like, like state television. And, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion that there should not be a ministry of information, but that might be too much to expect. Um, Matt, I'm big on interior ministry reform. You know, one of my, I've been trying to sort of figure out my list of metrics for how to judge the progress of the revolution. And topping my list is civilian oversight over the interior minister. A min an interior minister who is not some career general who owes 30 years of favors to the other career generals 
and probably they all have secrets on each other and, and it's just unhealthy. A, a, a civilian, an outsider, interior minister. And when you talk to police officers, they always say, that the, and, and, and it's hilarious because they, I think they all went to the same class on this. They, they all say, well, would you want a minister of health who's not a doctor? That wouldn't make sense. I was like, uh, no, I, I'm not buying it. it it's, it's a civilian interior minister sent there by an elected government with a popular mandate to clean the stables, fire whoever you need to fire, and change the culture. And that's, that's top three on things that need to happen reg regardless of what happens between the Brotherhood and the military. And I think that you know, there's a question of how is that going to happen and, and at what point. And they're going to be very resistant to it. Um, so let's, let's change and, and, and talk about the, um, the Brotherhood and the Freedom and Justice Party and, and the, the chances that it may fragment um, uh, given, given their intention what, or what appears to be their, their um, movement towards accommodating, accommodation with the, the SCAF. Um, you know, we, we can't say that the Freedom and Justice Party is a monolith. Uh, there are generational differences that have been noted. Um, certainly, um, there must be some uh, Muslim Brotherhood members that were, were protesting in Tahrir. Um, you know, as there are fragments generally at the macro level of Egyptian society, one would assume that there will be fragmentation within um, within the Brotherhood and, and what impact uh, will, will that have in terms of the political dynamics in the country? What, Ashraf, what, what do you think the chances are for fragmentation? I think the fragmentation is already happening. It started yeah. immediately after uh, February 11th. It started immediately after Mubarak's departure. You had members of the youth wing break away and form, um, I think it's called the Egyptian Current Party. And that's, that was founded by dissident young brothers. You had Abdul Minam Abdul Futuh, who was a senior Brotherhood level, who had kind of been marginalized from the Brotherhood power structure in the, in the, in the preceding years. And he broke away and um, is running for president. And he's kind of, a, you know, and he's taking his followers with him. So the, the splintering is, is already happening and will continue to happen, but the Brotherhood is not going anywhere. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll draw some new people, they'll lose some people, it's, it's inevitable that it's easy to keep your unity when there's a big bad that, that, that you're trying to topple. After that, all the ideological differences come to the fore. The, uh, maybe the, the, the power struggles become more prominent. So it, it's, it's healthy, but, but the Brotherhood is going to remain a, a primary player. But, but, but the fragmentation, sure, it's happening. It'll continue. And I think what's actually quite striking, because it's true the fragmentation had begun, and I, I went back and read some of what people were writing before, and they said, they're losing the youth, they're losing some of the more moderate Islamists, and they're losing the Salafists. All true, in the end, they performed beyond what I think most experts were saying even a week before the election. So yes, they've lost some people, but as Ashraf said, they remain by far the strongest magnet. And it's actually quite remarkable that they could have, there's so many splinter groups, uh, that, and you meet them all the time, mm -hmm. they were not able to capitalize on these tensions within the movement. I think. You know, it doesn't mean that the Muslim Brotherhood isn't going to face the challenges. Any movement, you know, just look at Hamas. Once they start governing, all these contradictions come to the fore. And they also have to compete with what is, what do you want to call it, the right-wing version of Islam, is the Salafists. And how are they going to position themselves? They want to reassure both non-Islamists at home and the West. And that, anyone who meets with them, that's the number one priority. They will tell you everything you want to hear. In my view, they've mastered the art of, saying, of speaking a lot and saying nothing because they want to make so sure that you're not going to say anything that somebody could be worried about. But they are going to have members of parliament, the Salafists, who might introduce, if they want to embarrass them, legislation on social issues, on other issues that is going to make the Muslim Brotherhood have to make a real choice. Do we reassure and risk alienating our base? Or do we try to stick to our base and to, to the, where the Salafists want to drag us at the risk of, of alienating uh, the West and... and and those in our own country will be worried. I think that's, that's going to be a, a challenge for the Muslim Brotherhood. I think they're more worried about the Salafists than they are either about their own internal problems or about the secular forces. But the Salafists are not going to take a position on foreign policy issues. Um, they, 
are their interests more internal? Um, because I think it's when, um, I think for, from the perspective of the U.S., when uh, radical Islam becomes a problem is when it, it confronts uh, foreign policy uh, mm -hmm. interests. Um, and, you know, will, will it just be a matter of accommodation between the Brotherhood and the Salafists so that the Salafists can um, do their thing internally, domestically, socially, um, and then uh, the Brotherhood and, and uh, you know, the military authorities can continue to control the foreign policy domain. Is it, do you think the Salafists have an assertive agenda on, on, the, on, that, on the, the foreign, foreign policy? policy? They might make a run at Camp David in some form, but uh, or at least to, to modify Camp David, that would be crowd pleasing, I think. But beyond that, no, I, I think they're going to focus on a domestic agenda. And, and Rob points out a very interesting dynamic that, that, that could come forward and that the Salafists could really embarrass the Brotherhood in many ways and put them in uncomfortable positions and that you, you know, you bring forth some sort of, of uh, domestic legislation that, that brings the country in line with whatever they think the Sharia is and you put the Brotherhood in a position of alienating the West and the secular liberal coalition partners by, by, vote, by, by siding with this or you put the Brotherhood in a position of doing something that the Salafists can then say is non-Islamic, you know, and say, oh, no, power has changed them. They've gone soft on, on, on Islam. You know, it's, it's, it's going to be fascinating. I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to watching this all play out. It's going to be amazing. I, I would say, though, uh, um, having because I, I, you know, I, I do think that could be a dynamic. Right now, it's not what we're seeing. I mean, I met the Salafists in leadership in December and then in January. Okay. The progress, progress, the evolution in a month, was extraordinary. And they've become the Muslim Brotherhood, what it took the Muslim Brotherhood years and years and years to become sort of a moderate, reassuring face. The Salafists are trying to do in a matter of weeks. They've been taking PR crash courses. That's, That's what the impression it gave, they absolutely. In, yeah. in December, I, I met with, with the leader and, and the answers he gave me were, you know, I wasn't entirely clear and I asked him, if I were sitting now with your Muslim Brotherhood counterpart, what would be the difference in what I'm hearing? And he said, the difference is the Muslim Brotherhood would be lying. They tell you we want rights of women, respect the cops, democracy. They don't really believe it. We don't know if we believe it. We have tensions within our movement. It happens so quickly. So I can tell you now, some of us think, yes, we like democracy because it gives us a voice. Do we really believe that it's a right form of government? We're going through the, our learning process. Two weeks ago, I meet uh, the, 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 the leadership. All the right answers from a Western perspective. Yes, women. We don't impose Sharia on anyone. It's an individual decision. We're not going to touch Camp David. As you say, PR classes, but at warp speed. I mean, I, it was very impressive to see how quickly they became those who they were denouncing only a few weeks earlier. <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be fascinating to watch. I mean, the, the Salafists especially, they're the wild card because these guys have not really had a live mic turned on them. They've been sort of in the shadows, and now they've got their own TV channels. They're being interviewed live on television. They're... they're they're on the parliament floor, so uh, you know having to build coalitions. So that it's it's, it's going to kind of be fun to watch. Um, yes, I just want to. I guess we have a very enthusiastic, anxious audience. <laughs> um, so I was going to just give it another five minutes. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit about U.S. foreign policy. Um, and whether or not the U.S. has a role in, in Egypt now, and, and uh, you know, given, given the internal dynamics, which, as you say, are very interesting, um, and, and it will be wa interesting to watch, um, should, should the U.S. Uh, just play sort of a hands-off role and let, let Egypt, um, let the Egyptian politics sort of take their, their own turn? Um, is that even possible, um, given the U.S. Uh, support for for the you know very strong, uh, large uh, support military assistance for for Egypt? Um, what what you know what is the perception of Egyptians, and what is your sense of what role the U.S. can play? Um, no, it's a in good question. Context? I mean, d definitely the U.S. is right to be treading carefully because, and I'm sure during the revolution there, there was a lot of kind of debate and trepidation of where do we, what do we say, even if, even if we, the U.S., are pro-revolution, if coming out 
pro-revolution could hurt the revolution. And, and, and I'm sure there was a lot of, you know, I, I always suspect, and Rob might have more insight into this, that, you know, in, in and around the military's much lauded and much praised decision to not fire on civilian protesters, I've always suspected there was a lot of very quiet, very firm U.S. arm twisting on that, or, or just, just a kind of a, a, ba a quiet, don't you dare even think about it from Washington. Um, so, you know, if that really happened, I'm grateful for it. But um, what should the U.S. do going forward? I'm sure it's very confusing. And I would kind of fall back to some of these metrics that I'm trying to devise as far as, like, how do you judge a stable or a, a successful post-revolutionary landscape? And I think among the U.S. priorities should be is pushing a civilian, in a genuine internal interior ministry reform. You know, um, B, civil society, leaving civil society to, to, to grow without hindrance, without harassment, and that's obviously what's happening right now. My biggest concern, obviously in Washington, the big deal is the, the, the attack on the NGOs, and we're, we're always mentioning IRI, NDI, Freedom House. There's a whole host of Egyptian NGOs that got raided on that day as well. And long after IRI and NDI get their files back and Sam Lahoud gets on a plane and everyone hails a new era for Egyptian-U.S. Uh, relations, these Egyptian NGOs might be completely screwed. They might never get their files back. They might have had their work set back a decade. And I just hope that the administration keeps that in mind and keeps a very sharp eye on leaving civil society to, to grow naturally without harassment. And to focus on the transitional reform that needs to happen. Just two, two general comments. I'm, I'm sure we're going to get into more of U.S. policy in the question and answer, but point about relevance and then a point about effectiveness. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not entirely clear to me how much relevance the U.S. is going to have. I think it goes to the point Ashraf was making about the rediscovery of domestic politics. Peop the political leaders in Egypt are going to have an eye fixated much more on the street and domestic political opinion than they are on what's happening in the corridors of power in Washington. Very unlike the time of, of Mubarak, where the relationship with the U.S. was a pillar of legitimacy. Today, that's not the case. So I think you're going to find, and I think the U.S. has already found to its, to its detriment, that it doesn't have the kind of pull. Or you wouldn't see what you're seeing now with the NGOs, which is such a slap in the face, particularly precisely at the time when the Egyptians need foreign assistance. Mm. Uh, they're, they're doing that. I mean, it really tells you what they care about in terms of, 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 uh, of, of the balance between what they hear in Washington and what they hear on the streets of Egypt. Um, just an anecdote, I was uh, doing a radio uh, uh, show and there was an Egyptian, very well informed was on it, and it was the day in November when at three in the morning, I think the White House put out a statement criticizing the scaf for the violence uh, against protesters. And at one point, the Egyptian journalist was asked, I think she was actually a, member, uh, a journalist and politician, what did you think of the US statement? She said, I know there was an EU statement. I think there was another statement. I didn't even know there was a US statement, which, I mean, it was, and I know that the, the US labored for hours about how, how to calibrate the statement. I think it said something about how less relevant the US is. But then there's a question of effectiveness. And one thing that really struck me on this last trip, and you hear it all the time, and every time I hear it, it's hard for me to believe it, but the SCAF and many other Egyptians believe it so much that I can't dismiss it. They're convinced that the U.S. is engaged in a conspiracy to weaken, to fragment, to, dis to, to, to undermine Egypt's power. And I, that was certainly Mubarak's view, I think, at the end of his, t of his tenure. But it's the view of the military establishment, and perhaps more, that today what you're seeing on the street is very much a U.S. attempt. You know, part of this is pretextual. They want to blame an outsider. But I happen to believe that it's also a genuine belief they have. They can't imagine that all this wouldn't have happened with some foreign hand. And the most convenient foreign hand, that, or the most credible in their eyes, is the US. The US also has a very mixed, is a generous word, reputation among other Egyptians. So you're not seeing Egyptians today rushing to ask the US to intervene more, even on the NGO issue. I think there was a piece the other yeah. day pointing out how, and many of the Egyptians we met were as critical of the US funded NGOs as they were, or more so than of the SCAF. So I think the US has to tread carefully, not just you know, for all the balancing of its own interests, but because it has the legacy of an extremely negative reputation having to do with its policies in Egypt, its policies in the region. Um, 
And that means that sometimes what it's going to say is going to backfire because those both in power and in public opinion are going to react against what the U.S. says, not because of the content of what it says, but because of the, the, the perception and the, 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 uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the problems of reputation that the U.S. has. Right. Okay, we have a very anxious uh, member of the audience here. I'll give her the mic first. Thank you very much, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. Um, I want to talk about Egypt's role in the region. Uh, it's interesting that they would say that U.S. was trying to undermine Egypt's role since Egypt hasn't had much of a role in the last few years. So the question is, can it play a role regionally? What factors do you see that might actually cause it to, to be able to overcome this domestic turmoil and play a role regionally? If Israel... Uh, attacks Gaza again and kills a lot of Palestinians, will there be pressure to do something about the peace treaty? If Israel attacks Iran, will there be pressure to do something about the peace treaty? Or can we expect this year that it's just going to be Egypt focused inward, desperately trying to get its affairs in order? Thanks. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. I think uh, on the one hand, it's true that Egypt is much more internally uh, focused. and. The fact that the recent peace talks, if that's what they're called, are taking place in Jordan tells you something about uh, diminishing Egyptian weight, which, as Barbara, as you point out, is, is nothing new. Um, and so I think it's going to take some time. I think for now, the main power Egypt has is a negative form of power. It's sort of the power of the weak, as, as people used to describe when it comes to the Palestinians. When you go to Israel and you ask, ask the Israeli officials about what leeway they have to do things in Gaza, for example, they say their main concern is how Egypt will react. Not that Egypt is going to react by you know, military action, but they're going, to, they're going to be forced because of public opinion to cut diplomatic relations, to bolster their ties with the Palestinians. And they just don't want right now to have yet more problems with, with Egypt. So they're just afraid that Egypt, because of its own public opinion, is going to have to take much more assertive uh, stances. So when there was the, the attack against Eilat uh, several months ago, uh, and there was speculation about whether Israel would re-enter Gaza, the Israelis I met said the key factor that led them to be more restrained in their reaction was that they were afraid of, of how a weak Egyptian uh, uh, regime would react. And I think that's going to be true for some time. At some point, Egypt will recover its role. I mean, part of and Ashraf, when he speaks very in his book and, and, and today about how a lot of this was a, 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 a Egyptians trying to recover their dignity and their role. I think there was an aspect of the sense that what role is Egypt playing in the region now? I mean, what humiliation, embarrassment is it that we now are a bit player when Qatar and others are playing a much bigger role? I think that time will come. I once thought that it would come more quickly than I do now because I think the magnitude of the domestic problems is such that it's going to take a while for Egypt to recover its natural role, but sooner or later it will come. I think that, that Egypt moving forward, and, and it might take a while, they, 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 they might be kind of self-obsessed and domestically focused for a while, but I think a, a, a reforming Egypt could play a very positive role in the region. I think Egypt has been one of the factors dragging the region backwards for, for a decade plus. Um, so an Egypt that's built around rule of law and a genuine merit, meritocratic society and trusted national institutions could, could be a real beacon in the region. That's what I'm counting on. But in terms of, of current geopolitical issues, certainly uh, another flare-up in Gaza, another Israeli attack on, on Gaza is going to put the government, any government that exists, under tremendous pressure to do more than has been done previously. And I don't think that means doing anything to Camp David. I, I don't think that the Camp David Treaty is, in any, is under any threat in, in the short or medium term. I think there might be a request for some alterations to enable um, some more leeway on the, on the Gaza border, on the Rafah border, on what can go in and what can go out, because that's a highly unpopular stance. Like Basically, Egypt being told from the outside what they can do on this border was a hugely humiliating thing for Mubarak that really hurt him domestically. And I don't think they're going to let that one go by again. Um, beyond that, yeah, I think a lot of it, there's going to be pressure to treat Gaza differently. And I think that's, that's really the extent of it in the short term. But I'd also like to say that having a situation where the Israeli government 
now has to worry about the opinion of the Egyptian people before taking an action, that's great. That's healthier than it's been in a long time because I think both sides, the way that Camp David has been practiced, both sides, it's, it's been unhealthy. I think Mubarak has known for decades that he could do whatever he wanted to his own people and he would still be a moderate as long as he kept to Camp David. And the Israelis knew they could do whatever they wanted and not have to worry about public opinion in their largest and most powerful regional ally. That's not a real partnership. That's not, that's not actually peace. That's just counting on Mubarak to shove it down his people's throats. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to take a while, and I'm not saying there's not going to be some serious bumps in the road, but I'm looking, for a, looking forward to a much more mature Israeli-Egyptian relationship. And this is the start of it. I want the Israelis to be worried about Egyptian public opinion. The, the Egyptians are worried about Israeli public opinion. Why not? If I could piggyback on that, because I think that's a very important point. I think that the relationship has been dysfunctional on both sides. Uh, the Israelis claiming that you know, they're the only democracy in the region as if that was a bad thing, but in fact they were very happy dealing with authoritarian regimes uh -huh. because they get, get, get away with things. And the Egyptians you know, clamoring for Palestinian rights rhetorically, but in fact being perfectly happy to deal with whatever Israeli policies or U.S. policies. So I, th I, I think it's both interesting and positive. I agree completely. Ashraf mentioned Gaza. I just cut back from Gaza 10 days ago. Oh. And it was interesting is when you speak to the Hamas leadership, in, in, in Gaza, and you know, they, they would echo a lot of what you said in terms of how they see Egypt. Number one, they don't think changes are gonna come overnight. They're quite you know, pragmatic, they say, right now the people who are dealing with the Gaza file are the same people who dealt with it under Mubarak. But oh. give it a year, they say, and policy towards Gaza cannot stay the same, Rafah cannot be dealt with as before, Egypt is gonna have to be slightly more vocal and balance its relationship between Fatah and Hamas. They see this, again, as a longer-term game, um, but they certainly see sort of the winds of history blowing uh, in their favor, at least I'm talking about the Hamas leadership in Gaza. It may be slightly different elsewhere. Can you wait for the mic, please, because we have CSP. I'm Farzani Rudi with Population Reference Bureau in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Ashraf, you mentioned about the role of Tunisia played and the frustration of young people. Uh, my question is, and a lot it has been said about the role of all young people, if Egypt had a population with age structure of Japan, uh, how would have you see this whole revolution would have evolved? Meaning a much older demographic? Right. Yeah, I mean, this young population were... Uh, in proportion to the total population were less. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, the impact of being so many young people. Right. What, what percentage of the population is youth in Egypt? It must be 60%. What's the number in here that you've heard? It's, I, I've heard any number. Close to half. 29% of the population is between the ages of 15 and 29. A third is between it, uh, 15 and 29. Okay. A third. Okay. okay. Uh, no, obviously so there's this, this huge bubble of youth coming up and another and another wave before them that's this kind of lost generation that's 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 28 that are now 28 to 32 with nothing going on and no hope and no prospects and and I, that was a huge factor of course the failure of the Mubarak government to provide economic opportunity uh, to these multiple generations and possibly the failure to provide them with the skills to go out and earn some money for themselves without the, 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 the sort of um, socialist guaranteed uh, public sector job infrastructure that's kind of going away. So no, it was, it was huge, it was huge. And, and part of it you can't blame the government for because it's a huge problem and I would hate to be the one in charge of solving it. But a lot of money disappeared, a lot of jobs were handed out unfairly. Um, you know, they, 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 they're, they're really, I do blame the Mubarak government for failing to provide hope for these multiple generations. And, and yes, that did, that was one of the major factors fueling the revolution. But, but, the, but, the, but the youth were not the only ones in the streets. No, the youth were not the only ones. And one of the, the greatest things that, you know, that, that I saw again and again during the revolution was multiple generation families in Tahrir. And, and there, was, there was once a quote, Omar Soleiman, you know, the, the brief vice president uh, 
uh, you know, longtime shadowy intelligence chief who served as vice president for like a week or two before Mubarak fell. And he gave this obnoxious interview at one point to, I think, Christian Amanpour, where he, he, he said, you know, A, he mispronounced the Muslim Brotherhood like four times. He called them the Brother Muslimhood. <laughs> and, and B, he said, it's like, oh, yes, we will, you know, what, what she, she asked, what will you say to the, to, the, to, the, to the protesters in Tahrir? He's like, oh, I tell them, I will tell them to go home. And I will tell their parents to come and get them and take them home. And, and I did a radio interview like that night uh, with an American radio station. And they, they mentioned that quote to me. And I was like, that's hilarious because I just came back from Tahrir and I was talking to somebody who's there with their parents and their grandmother. So, <laughs> so that's not going to fly. He's dealing with something much more than irresponsible, reckless youth here. And if they, if they still think that's what's happening, then that's why they're losing this game. I think it'll be interesting to see how the demographics of the protest movement change, if, it, if at all, going forward. Um, we have a question here in the back. Uh, gentlemen. Thanks. Um, Zach Gold from Brookings. Uh, you started the conversation with one of the main reasons for the revolution was economics, and yet we have not touched on the current economic problems that Egypt has, as well as the insecurity. Police haven't been on the street. Banks are finally being robbed. Uh, I was wondering if you could um, address those issues. Thank you. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll say very quickly, and then I'd love yeah. to hear from, from Asher, but I, I think I did mention that those are going to be the biggest challenges that the new uh, government is going to have to deal with. Economic situation, which is, which is I mean, the paradox, one of the par many paradoxes of the revolution was that it was fueled in part by economic distress and uh, a sense of economic deprivation, both of which have been made worse, I can't say because of the revolution, but because of the circumstances that exist today. And so that's, that's a, you know, that's, that's a huge factor. And the, the insecurity, which is both natural when you're in, in a state of, 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 of uncertainty, but also because a lot of the police who feel that they were sort of the, the scapegoats of what happened, they're like, okay, uh, see if you could deal with, with the situation without us. Um, and both of those, I think, are, are, are extremely dangerous. And one of the things I felt, again, I, I, don't, I certainly haven't been in Egypt as much as Ashraf, I felt a lot of pent-up frustration and violence. I saw more street fights in Cairo yeah. than I'd ever seen. And I was there for, for five days. Okay. And I saw some extremely brutal and dangerous fights with people taking baseball bats. And my, that's very anecdotal, but my impression was here are people who, are, who don't really see a future. They're, the economy is, 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 is not doing well. The tourism, I mean, if you go to the Cairo airport, I'd been, I was there a month before the revolution, a year ago as a tourist, and then I went back at about the same time this year, and the airport was empty, and the hotels are empty. I mean, and for, for an economy that deals that needs stability for tourism, that needs stability for foreign investment, it's going to be, it's, it's extremely uh, uh, harmful. And I'm, this is one of the factors, one of sort of the variables that I, I don't know how they're going to deal with it. And it could go very badly, very quickly, if the economy doesn't recover, if the security situation doesn't recover, who knows what happens next. But uh, you live there every day. So. Sure. No, exactly as Rob said. I mean, the economy wasn't going all that great before the revolution. I mean, it was one of those situations where Egypt was one of the IMF World Bank darlings, but the situation on the ground was just, it just wasn't tangible. You just had more and more economic desperation and, and this, this visible vis and resentment flowing from seeing the haves, seeing the top 7% just living so well right in front of you while everything else was so hard. And since that, from that humble beginning, things have gotten much worse. It, it, it's, um, the, the, the tourism is a major thing. And tourism is not just the seaside communities and the guys who live, uh, who work at the pyramids. Tourism is one of those things that extends into every aspect of the economy. And that's dried up or is operating at very low capacity. And every time there's one of these flare-ups, you know, the, the, the irony is, I keep saying, street action is the only thing that produces concessions. But every time you get shots of street violence on television, that's like two more months of tourists gone. And it's huge. And, and that is one of the aspects that is, or that has turned the population against the, the ongoing protests. You know, the, the phrase that keeps popping up, and I, hear, I see it in the newspapers, and I hear it from everybody, and I, 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 it, it's, it's the wheel of production. We have to get the wheel of production moving. And the first time I heard that, I thought it was hilarious. I thought it was this weird kind of Stalinist hangover of a term. <laughs> but but it's, it's important. It's really people are listening to that, and they think the protesters are holding up the wheel 
of production. They think they're 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 holding the country hostage for their for, for their you know irrational uh, demands. So that's you know the, the the economic situation is not great and it's not getting better and 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 the the the, the perception of insecurity is is very bad and 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 I do hold the, the 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 curious thing to me is that people blame the protesters for the lack of security and I get into these debates with people they don't blame the police for not showing up for their jobs like I I I've, I've had these arguments with people in Egypt where where they kind of act like it's the protesters fault I was like I'm sorry I missed the point where or missed the part where we killed 100,000 police officers they're sitting at home why are you not mad at them? And why are we not yelling at the interior minister to get these people back on the job? So there's a, there's a bit of a disconnect there. But, but yeah, it, it, it needs to right itself fairly quickly. And I'm not optimistic that it will. It's, it's one of the larger concerns. Uh, Peck Simpson, freelance writer. I spent 10 years in uh, Poland starting in 1990. And, you know, the average wage was $35 a month for everybody. Coal miners, a little more. Doctors, a little less. And, you know, but the whole system collapsed. You know, they really had no choice but to start over. I'm curious as to how, when you had robust tourism, you know, before the protest, there still was this economic inequality and there still were these people who couldn't afford to have good jobs or get good jobs after they got their degrees to move out i don't as you know with a country that is still there the whole country hasn't collapsed you don't have a an opportunity you know or an obligation to start over again i don't know how how you go about rebuilding an an economy not just to get the old economy back but to rebuild it so that there is a wider opportunity for everybody well, I'll say a couple of things very quickly. I mean, in that one, and tangible things. One, an actual, genuine, sincere, and enforceable anti-corruption crusade. That's going to make a difference. Not only in that less money will disappear, but that's going to encourage foreign investment. I mean, I think there's a whole host of multinational corporations that were willing. It speaks volumes about how attractive a market Egypt is, that all these corporations were willing to pay the 10 to 20% corruption tax overhead just to do business in Egypt. Those companies still want to do business in Egypt. If we actually take away, if we even reduce it by 50%, the corruption, if it's only 10% of the money that disappears, that's going to be an improvement. And that's not even taking into account the medium-sized businesses that look at Egypt and go, oh, you know, let's just stay out of that. We can't afford the, the, the corruption overhead. So you, know, you can fix things in a, in a way that brings more money in and keeps more money in the public sphere. Actual tax collection. You know, I mean, the only taxes that are collected is if you're in a multinational or a big corporation, it's taken from, the, from, from, your, from your paycheck. But, you know, income tax? Not really. Not really. It's, you know, there's so many loopholes. I, probably, I don't even know the percentage that's paid. But there are ways to, if you, a properly running country will have better economic prospects. But my sense is that if you're going to run those campaigns, then you have to accept sort of the, the status quo that's emerging, right? So do you protest against SCAF or do you protest uh, for, for anti-corruption and toward, toward the minister of, of uh, economics to, to do something about corruption? So I think there's a conflict there, a quagmire. Um, I'm, going to I'm conscious of the fact that we only have five minutes, so I'm going to take a couple of questions and, and then you can answer them together. Um, we have uh, one in the back here and one up here. Hi, Mark Kimmett. First, the, the question I have is about the uh, upcoming policy Thought debate. I recognized you. Hi, yeah, Mark. How are you? Good to see you. It's been, been a while. Been in Baghdad. How are you doing? Yeah, exactly. Back a couple years. Yeah. Um, the question is $1.3 billion that the U.S. gives in foreign military financing, that obviously there's going to be a great policy debate whether we should, in fact, give it this year. Uh, recognizing the responsibilities to Camp David, or if that should be used as a method with the SCAF, some of who are here at present, uh, to make sure that they keep to their commitments. Is that is that a good enough or capable enough tool to get the attention of the SCAF? And second question, you talk a lot about Mubarak being the pharaoh. It, it, nobody's really talked about the Sphinx, and that's Tentawi. Uh, 
I'd be, I'd be very interested in your comments about the field marshal, how he's playing with the SCAF, and is he the right guy to uh, uh, transition the SCAF out of a job? Up here. Uh, yes, thank you. I'm Eric Motu from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, just to continue on the theme of the economy, um, as you know, the, the Egyptian authorities are currently discussing with the IMF and other international organizations uh, on a possible uh, package of financial assistance. But my question to the panelists uh, is, uh, how do you see the role or the potential role of the IMF and other international uh, financial uh, organizations uh, in supporting financially uh, the Egyptian transition, avoiding a crisis? And do you think the Egyptians themselves uh, are ready to, to accept a role for, for the IMF and others, uh, recalling that in June there was a, a package of assistance uh, worth $3 billion that was signed and sealed, but that was subsequently rejected by, uh, by the, the authorities. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear your views on, on that. Thank you. Uh, just, maybe I'll make a few points. Um, on the $1.3 I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, it got SCAF's attention. There have been contacts between uh, uh, Tantawi and uh, President Obama. They've been trying to reassure, but not enough attention that it's led the, the SCAF to reverse some of the decisions that were made on the NGOs. Yet, in fact, things got even worse with the sort of, uh, prohibition on some, some of the NGO uh, members to leaving the country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think at some level, the Egyptian military can't even imagine that in the long run the U.S. will withhold that money because they see it's so much part of the post-Camp David architecture. And they also believe that it's in America's strategic interest to have this kind of relationship with, with Egypt's military. So I suspect that they believe that ultimately it will all will be fine. Um, they may be more aware now that this is not solely an administration decision. The Congress has a real say on this, and the mood on the Hill is not particularly favorable right now. Uh, to 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 the, the military, particularly because of some of the very egregious steps they took. So it's a difficult instrument to use because in some ways I think it does, you know, from the perspective of the administration, it would be quite disastrous if they were to cut that funding. Uh, but on the other hand, their hands are not completely free. Um, I've heard some Egyptians tell me that over time they'd be prepared to uh, live without the 1.3 billion, which in any event they say helps America's economy just as much, because all of that, as you yeah. know, the money is, then has to be spent in, in, in buying weapons from the US. Uh, I suspect that for now they're going to find a way out of this, but I think it may be a, 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 a taste of things to come. Um, is Tantari the right person? As I said earlier, I'm not sure that anyone has inherited the job they were prepared for because they all are sort of remnants of another era. So I would not say Tantari is sort of was, was born and bred to be the person who's going to transition Egypt from military to civilian rule. I, the last thing I'd say, and as we were discussing earlier, the mismanagement, just in terms of tactics, of, of you know, if you know you're going to ultimately make a concession, make it when it looks like you're doing it magnanimously, not under pressure because you sent all the wrong messages. So my sense is he's not actually you know, the, the right person, and we'll have to see what happens after June, July. I mean, is, does he still have that position? Some people say he'll leave. Other people say that, you know, he's, there's temptation for him to run for president, which mm -hmm. I, I kind of doubt. Um, but no, I think right now the military leadership is dealing with a deck of, of cards that it's not familiar with. It's trying to protect as much of its interests as possible, while at the same time transitioning to civilian rule, which from their perspective will give them the power they, will, they hope will leave them with the power they want without the responsibility that they fear. Okay, yeah, it's the, the, using the military funding, I, I like what Rob, Rob was saying, uh, in the, that the, I think the military is starting to come to grips with the fact that, that just having tight relations with the Pentagon is not enough. They're, they're starting to understand that their standing in Congress is not as good as it was a year ago, and that that's important. And I'm sure they're not quite sure what to do with that. Using the military funding as a lever, I, I suspect... As, as, as Rob said, that the, that the military would not take that threat credibly. I think that they think at the end of the day, the money's going to come from America. And I'm not sure, I, I, I don't know where I stand on that, whether I think they're right about that or not. As far as how it's used, or you know, the public perception of that, I know within the activist community, the, 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 the quote unquote Camp David money 
you know, I, they don't think it's important at all. They, don't, they, they, they think that most of it doesn't stay in Egypt, and that which does stay in Egypt stays in the military. So it was never, you know, the, the, I, I know many longtime activists that have argued passionately that, that it's worth walking away from Camp David, that, 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 that the Camp David money is overrated. Um, as far as Tantawi, I mean, I'm not sure how much, how many people here remember this a uh, couple months ago. What was it, like November-ish, maybe October, when Tantawi suddenly appeared downtown wearing a suit, shaking hands, kissing babies, and acting for all intents and purposes like a man running for political office. And then he just went away. And it, nobody knew what to make of that, like whether it was whether they were just messing with us or something, or whether he was trial ballooning something. But at the end of the day, the guy is, you know, more than from the old regime, super symbolic of the old regime. He's well into his 80s, and frankly, he was rumored to be in very poor health long before the revolution. So staying power, the man to lead the country forward. No, I think it's much more. There's always been a lot of speculation about some of the officers just below him. Uh, a man named Sami Anen, who is, um, I believe, chief of staff would be his, his title. And he was actually in America when the revolution kicked off. And he's very much an interlocutor between uh, Cairo and D.C. Ahmed Shafiq, who was a former head of the Air Force and former minister of civil aviation, who served very briefly as prime minister here, I guess he was Mubarak's last prime minister and lasted a couple of weeks after the revolution, but he's still kind of, I mean, he's not active military anymore, but but he's a name and he's a player. But yeah, Tantawi, I, I, I do think Tantawi's on his last legs. Okay, um, we will have to close now um, as we've hit the scheduled end time. So I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, Ashraf is going to stick around and he'll be here to sign uh, books, with copies of which have arrived, right? Okay. Um, so we, we have the books out in the lobby and Ashraf will stay. And I want to thank Rob uh, and Ashraf for, for the conversation. And I, I thank the audience. Thank you. Thank you.